We have everybody muted right now, and I'll ask you to remain on mute until the presentation is over. Um, and if time allows, we can ask questions. In the meantime, if you have questions, you can use the chat bar at the bottom. I hope everyone can see their see the screen uh, with Dr. Ellen Bogan's presentation and can hear us. If you can't, please send me a message, um, and we'll see if we can help you out there somewhere. And again, we'll ask everybody to please mute. Okay, so welcome again. Um, I am uh, very honored to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, Dr. Aaron Ellenbogen is a board certified neurologist. Um, he did his fellowship um, under Dr. Peter Lewitt. Uh, he is a movement disorder specialist. Uh, he is affiliated with uh, Ascension Macomb, Providence, um, Ascension St. John, um, and is at the Mind Clinic uh, in Farmington Hills. Full disclosure, I've known Dr. Ellen Bogan for um, a couple of years, um, and I know that we're in for an excellent presentation. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Ellen Bogan, ask him to unmute, and we'll get started. Okay, thank you, Julia. Yeah, it, as much as I enjoy you, it's been more than a couple of years, but that's great because it's been fun to work together on all sorts of endeavors. And, you know, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. So what I'm going to try to do tonight, and I want to start by saying this is not going to be comprehensive or exhaustive in any way, because really to do so would be hours and hours of, of talking, which frankly, I think it's better to give an idea of a flavor of what's going on, rather than um, try to dig into the weeds for each each uh, medication or each study that's going on, because I will talk about some non-pharmacologic things as well. So in looking at sort of an overview of what's going on in the research pipeline, there, there are a few things that I wanted to address. One of them is the, the reality is that there continues to be this effort to reformulate levodopa in one way or another. And this is something that for very obvious reasons, it is the um, it is the gold standard treatment for Parkinson's disease, or as my mentor, Dr. Lewitt, once wrote, he, he called it the platinum standard. And so there continues to be this effort to improve upon what we can offer with the use of levodopa. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. There's been this process of repurposing drugs, and there's a number of examples, uh, both current and uh, previous studies that have been done looking at the repurposing of drugs for use in Parkinson's disease. There are novel dopamine, dopamine agonists that are in development. Again, all of these things are largely looking at symptomatic treatment. Uh, so trying to help improve the symptoms that people experience when they have Parkinson's. Then we're gonna spend some time talking about disease modifying therapies because there've been some setbacks in a way, but there's also some novel approaches. And again, I, it will not be exhaustive or comprehensive. And then we'll talk about some non-pharmacologic interventions. And then finally, uh, there'll be some time to ask questions as well. So I really like this slide because A, it's fairly recently published. Um, you can, it, the reference is not here. It'll be on one of the subsequent slides, but this is published in, in uh, 2022. And I just want to really show you the breadth of things that are going on. So first of all, you can see at the bottom are drugs to treat symptomatic aspects of Parkinson's disease, and you can see the various phases from the outside in, so phase one, phase two, phase three in development, and then at the top are things that are being investigated potentially as disease-modifying therapies, and there's some things that may sound familiar, um, so exenatide, for example, and we'll talk a little bit about that, memantine, um, terazosin, which is a medication that's used for um, for prostate issues mostly, uh, and then things at the bottom where you see levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel, apple morphine. Uh, so there's continued efforts to um, figure out what role these medications can continue to play. Um, and then 
you know, the one thing that I don't really, in looking through this, I did not see anything that said marijuana or, uh, or, or, um, or CBD. However, I do want to point out that even psilocybin is here, and that is the psychoactive compound in uh, hallucinogenic mushrooms. So drilling down a little bit, um, we're, there's a number of ways of sort of breaking these things out. And so these are the phase one trials um, that were ongoing at the time. So there's things targeting alpha synuclein, which would be disease modifying. You can see here, there's sort of this other category, uh, antioxidant cell therapy. So things that can potentially work at the cellular level to try to assess uh, or, or improve aspects of Parkinson's, anti-inflammatories, symptomatic, ther symptomatic therapies with dopaminergic medications, and so on around the wheel here. Phase two, we see more agents and more trials. And again, the same sorts of things that are that are being looked at. Again, more antioxidants, uh, things targeting alpha-synuclein, non-dopaminergic symptom relief. And as you can see here, there's now you start to see cannabidiol. Um, there's herbal medicines that are being investigated and so on. And then the phase three trials. And these are the things as we move through that development process that have made it through those first two hurdles and have gotten to the point where they are now in those final phases to submit to the FDA. And in some cases, some of these have now been submitted to the FDA. So the ABV V951, um, there's apple morphine, which is a, another one that's available, but in a different formulation, exenatide, and so on. So we're going to start by really uh, dialing in on reformulations of levodopa, and I'm going to uh, use a few examples that are either submitted to the FDA or are soon to be submitted to the FDA. As a reminder in Parkinson's disease, one of the big challenges is that levodopa over time starts to have a, a less predictable response. And you know, there's this misconception out there that this is really an, an effect of people becoming resistant to the medication. And, and this is, I just want to reiterate, because I still hear this not infrequently, this is truly a misconception. People continue to do well with levodopa uh, if they have Parkinson's disease and really until the very late stages should have a, a fairly clear response to medication. However, what happens is that because Parkinson's disease is a systemic condition and affects the GI tract, um, among other things, the impacts of Parkinson's on the gastrointestinal system actually impair our body's ability to absorb levodopa. And there's a couple of things that happen. Number one, there may be issues with solubilization of the oral medication. So you need it to solubilize and, and basically dissolve in order to be able to have it pass through the stomach and ultimately into the small intestine where it gets absorbed. The other thing that happens is that people can have delays in emptying of their stomach. And so a medication can sometimes be taken and can be sitting there for hours in some cases. And therefore, although someone's taken a dose of medication, they experience a failure of that dose to work. And so they can have an off episode as a result of that. So there has been an effort with medications that are already on the market to uh, bypass the GI tract. And so the medications that are sometimes deemed or referred to as rescue therapies or on-demand therapies, there's an inhaled levodopa preparation, there's an injectable apple morphine, and there's a, a strip that can be dissolved in the mouth as well of apple morphine. And those are medications that bypass the GI tract. And so that we're not relying on the GI tract in those situations to get medication absorbed. So that same concept is being applied to carbidopa, levodopa in a different way. And one company that's done that is AbbVie. Um, they already have a medication that's marketed that's a levodopa intestinal gel. The, the drawback, of course, of using an intestinal gel like that is that it requires a surgical procedure to put a tube into the small intestine. And then there's a pump that's attached to it and the medication is infused directly into the small intestine. So you're still relying on the GI tract for absorption, but you're helping to bypass some of those issues. So the next step in their repertoire, if you will, was development of this uh, medication, which is a continuous subcutaneous delivery of a, a FOS carbidopa and FOS levodopa. So this is not new technology. Um, there's actually an anti-seizure medication that 
has been around since the time I was in training. So it's been you know in excess of 20 years, but applying this to carbidopa levodopa. So the way the study was done is it took people who had at least two and a half hours of off time during the course of the day so they could tell that their medication wasn't working. Of course, it was placebo controlled and blinded study. Um, and what we saw really as a result of this was an increase of about 2.72 hours of on time versus just under an hour in the placebo group. So we saw that there is a clear separation between the people who got the active treatment and people who got uh, the placebo. This in total, when you subtract the placebo response, turns out to be about one and three quarters of hour, hours of on time per day. So a couple things to keep in mind here. Um, I, I want to go back and talk about the placebo response for a second, because this is something that not infrequently in people who participate in studies, they always say, I want the active treatment. And what I try to reassure people people is that there is a wealth of data that show that people who participate in studies do better. And that's where what we're really seeing the placebo response. So there's a variety of factors why people may actually do better for participating and having that placebo response, but it's a very real phenomenon. And again, we see here that it accounts for, which, which is quite typical, about an hour of increased on time per, per day. The most common adverse reactions or adverse events related to this were skin related. 27% of people experienced redness of the skin. 26% um, had skin, pain in the skin where the infusions were done, um, had cellulitis, which is an inflammation and sometimes even an infection of the skin in the area where the infusions were done. And 12% had swelling or edema in those areas. And the thing is the study actually had a fairly high discontinuation rate. Um, there were about 22% of people that actually discontinued because of adverse events related to this. So this certainly is a viable option for people uh, presuming it gets FDA approved. It, they have submitted, and we may hear as early as May whether or not they get approved. The challenge will be, of course, that even if they get approved, they had a pump that they submitted separately that would be late summer at the earliest that we would expect to hear about approval. So this is something that may very well be available to us by the end of the year. Um, but you can see that there were quite a few people who tried this who actually stopped it because of treatment, so or because of side effects. So shifting gears, again, the same concept. This is a company called Neuroderm. Um, and they originally started by trying to develop a patch formulation of carbidopa levodopa. And in order to deliver even close to an adequate amount of medication. The patch would have been the size of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. So you can imagine that that's something that's truly not viable in the long run. However, um, in, in the end, they settled on, a, again, a subcutaneous delivery of levodopa carbidopa. So this is actually not the same formulation as the prior one. Um, and the study was designed a little bit differently. You can't compare between the two because there's been no head-to-head -head studies. And frankly, the entire data set for this drug hasn't even been published yet. But they did, in a press release last month, uh, release some results. So we'll get to those in a few minutes. So that did meet the primary endpoint of on time without troublesome dyskinesia uh, versus immediate release oral levodopa preparation, which again was what was compared in the ABD study as well. This had a, a total effect of about 1.72 hours. So you can see that when you start to subtract out placebo, looks fairly similar, but again, different study design and certainly a little bit different population. It met the secondary endpoint as well of reduction in off time. So the adverse events are, again, mostly skin related, and they did not share the percentages of um, what percentage of people have. But I would tell you that. In the end, the, the things that we see, so hematoma, which is like a bruise um, infection, and again, redness, and you can see swelling as well, were more frequently reported in the group who got the infusion of medication versus oral medication. Um, however, there were some advantages on and off phenomenon, and falls were actually reported less frequently in the active treatment group, as you would expect, because these are things that um, people who are getting more on time and have their Parkinson's disease better treated may actually see a reduction in those things. The one thing that I think is interesting here um, is in comparison, and again, different studies. So you, in the end, you can't 
really draw any conclusions, but 6.3% of people randomized to the medication, the active treatment of NDO162 uh, had discontinued from the trial, uh, where and 5.5% discontinued because of adverse events. So the numbers are actually quite a bit smaller. And you know, in the long run, it remains to be seen whether or not um, there is something that differentiates this medication from the prior one. I would not anticipate a head-to-head -head study because it's really not in the interest of either company to do so. And so there are going to be people who may favor one treatment option or another. But again, this is one of the things that's sort of the way of the future. And the way that I describe this to people who participate in the study or people who ask about this is this is sort of like a diabetic would use an insulin pump. This is a carbidopa levodopa pump for someone who has Parkinson's. So similar sort of idea. The next one, uh, as far as reformulations of, uh, of levodopa is IPX203. And I think some of you who are out there may be familiar with uh, another medication that started with IPX and it was IPX066. And for people who take Ritari, if you look on the capsule of the Ritari, it actually says IPX066. So that was the predecessor to this medication. This is an oral formulation of an extended release carbidopa levodopa. The big thing is that this is dosed three times a day versus an average of five times daily for the immediate release formulation. So if you think of the, the regular old uh, Cinemet or the immediate release Cinemet, the 25100, um, not the ER or CR formulation. Um, and so that was the big thing is people with this medication could only be dosed three times a day in the, the double blind portion of the study. They again, very, very common to have about two and a half hours of off time as the minimum standard for enrollment into a study. And the reason that they required that is because you have to have enough off time to be able to show a difference, especially when there's a placebo response. It did meet its primary endpoint of good on time in favor of it compared to um, the immediate release formulation. And it added about a half hour of good on time. However, the thing that I want to point out, because people would say that and a half hour of good on time being added isn't necessarily meaningful. However, when you think about the fact that this is dosed three times per day and it reduces those fluctuations, so it reduces people cycling between on and off, that's important, number one. Number two is for anyone who has to take medication more often, it's harder to remain compliant and remain on schedule. So this is really still a significant improvement overtaking immediate release formulation. Uh, the most common adverse events in the study uh, were nausea, falls, and uh, urinary tract infection. And this was published in uh, May of last year. So again, relatively current. This has also been submitted to the FDA for approval. And so I anticipate, you know, based on the data I am familiar with and the FDA process, that we're going to see some action on this from the FDA this year as well. So what I wanted to do next was shift gears and talk a little bit about repurposing of drugs for Parkinson's disease. And there are a myriad of examples, some of them positive studies, some of them negative studies, but a couple that are ongoing right now. Uh, one of them is Xenotide, and this is uh, in a family of drugs, GLP-1 antagonists, and they are medications that are used to treat diabetes. However, uh, there was some evidence in preclinical work and in animal models um, that made people believe that this may actually improve dopamine neuronal function and reduce inflammation. And you know, I want to give a, a hats off to the folks at Van Andel because they were actually intimately involved in some of that early process and recognizing some of those uh, benefits. And so a phase two trial was ultimately done. People were kept on their usual medication regimen and they were randomized to get exenatide injections because it's a once a week injection or placebo. And the results, they were people were then assessed in what's called the practically defined off state. So that means that even if people were not motor fluctuators, they had to go for uh, a certain number of hours without having taken their medication. In practical terms, it's really going overnight without any medication. And what they saw in the people who got the exenatide, they actually had a very small improvement in their, their motor score um, in the UPDRS. So the, that scale that we use very commonly, uh, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. People who 
were on the placebo arm of this actually saw a decline in their score. So uh, that means basically that the lower the number, the less signs of Parkinson's, the higher the number, the more signs of Parkinson's are on the examination. So what really this started to prompt a thought about was that exenatide may be neuroprotective or may alter the progression of the disease a little bit. So again, that translational element from the animal models and preclinical work to a phase two trial with a relatively small number of patients. We're not, we're talking about 30 roughly in each arm, um, but showing that there does seem to be some difference. And so in the end, that led uh, to what is ongoing right now, which is a much larger phase three study to try to show that this does somehow meaningfully modify the progression of Parkinson's. So again, something that is a repurposing of a drug that was used for something else entirely. And I think that we will continue to see this, especially as we start to understand what these medications can do. The most common adverse reactions, and this is certainly uh, rings true within the diabetic population as well, injection site reactions, GI symptoms like nausea and upset stomach and um, dyspepsia and so on. And, and very common in, in the side effect profile, what was seen in the phase two study, what's seen in the in the uh, diabetic population as well, is that people tend to accommodate to the medication. So typically, those side effects occur relatively early in the, in the course of treatment, and people eventually get used to the medication and seem to go away. So the next medication I want to talk about, I, I think, is interesting as well because this is a medication, rifaximin, that is most commonly used for um, people who have liver disease. And they um, and it helps to mitigate some of the cognitive side effects of liver liver failure. So what's called hepatic encephalopathy. The other role, however, is that it's actually an antibiotic that's used to treat traveler's diarrhea caused by E. coli. And the the thought in evaluating this in Parkinson's is that it has the potential to change the gut microbiome. So there's one thing, there's a, a, a set of studies that have been done that show that it truly does change the gut microbiome in people with Parkinson's and can help, especially in uh, something called small bowel uh, bacterial overgrowth. And so that is one role that it potentially helps. And there's been some papers published on that. What I think is more interesting, though, is this seems to have an anti-inflammatory effect in people with Parkinson's. And in a small study, and you know, this is, some, this is the problem, is that this is, you know, the numbers are small, um, but we know that inflammation plays a role in Parkinson's, and it was actually shown to increase uh, anti the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10. Simultaneously, it actually reduced the levels of several inflammatory cytokines. So this is a medication that in further development, if it continues to be studied, we may see play a role. And one of the things that I sort of I want to bring to your attention when we start talking about the management of Parkinson's, especially if we do have something that demonstrates that it may be disease modifying in some meaningful way, is it may ultimately be that a combination of these medications that work in a variety of different ways will ultimately be the, the strategy that we use to try to slow down the progression of the disease. So if you get a small effect from several medications, that can potentially be additive or in an ideal situation may actually provide some sort of synergy where we can really have changes until the point we get to actually having a cure for this disease. So shifting gears back to um, medications that are novel, but um, again, treating symptomatic aspects of Parkinson's, we're going to talk about dopamine agonists. And, you know, these are very interesting medications for a couple of reasons. Just to give a little history lesson, uh, the first dopamine agonists were approved in, well, of the current generation of available medications were approved in 1997. And they were viewed as a, a substantial improvement over the treatment regimen that had been available for. Um, they were marketed under the names Mirapex and Requip or Pramipex and Rapinerol. There's also um, the, the Roticotine patch, which was marketed under Nupro, which came out a little bit later. Uh, but they, they were hailed as an advancement for a couple of reasons. Number one, they could help effectively treat symptoms. Number two, in the studies that were done, there seemed to be a lower rate of development of dyskinesia. 
as it turns out, the reason that that was the case is by allowing, by using a drug that's longer acting and allowing a, medi a medication to perhaps ultimately lead to a little bit lower dose of levodopa, there was less dyskinesia seen in the studies, even in people who were on a combination of the two medications. Um, however, what wasn't so easily identified were some of the side effects that came after the fact. So I, I think many people who are familiar with these medications are aware that they can cause impulse control disorders. So compulsive behaviors that are uh, include things like shopping, gambling, eating, and even sexual compulsivity. And so you know, from that regard, uh, people started to shy away from using dopamine agonists. We also know that they can ca cause or contribute to visual hallucinations. They cause nausea. They can cause drops in blood pressure and orthostatic hypotension and sudden onset of sleep. So, you know, the, the, these are medications, even when used in people who have Parkinson's, um, often run their course because over time, they seem to not provide enough of a symptomatic benefit where at the same time, we start to see uh, side effects really interfere with things. So, uh, the general overview of these medications is that they, um, the new medications and all dopamine agonists bind to dopamine receptors. So in the end, levodopa also binds to dopamine receptors, but these are designer drugs because as opposed to the original dopamine agonists, which have a lot of affinity for D2 and D3, and some of the side effects were attributed to binding a D4, there are five different dopamine receptors, very cleverly named D1 through D5. Um, it turns out that by changing those affinities and allowing them to bind more effectively and appropriately to different receptors and at certain levels, that may help improve both how effective they are, but it also may help mitigate some of the side effects. And so the other thing is, as opposed to, as you can see, this sort of struggle to get levodopa to last longer and these reformulations, whether it's continuous delivery under the skin or the IPX203, which is a medication that is an oral formulation, then you know, we're still trying to find ways to best stimulate those dopamine receptors. Uh, these medications are perhaps more amenable to longer acting formulations, and they may reduce the demands for levodopa in the long run. And in some of the early phases of these studies, one of the things that is done is that they will actually try to push the dose of some of the dopamine agonists to the point where people who are on levodopa are backing off or even stopping their, their levodopa preparation. So a couple of medications that are in clinical trials, and again, there are others, but I just wanted to show you how they're targeting different receptors. Uh, tevap tevapidon is one that has had sort of this long history. Um, it was designed specifically to target D1 and D5. Again, their early studies were inpatient, and patients did have a reduction in levodopa without any real deterioration, and actually were off of it without any clear deterioration in their motor function. Um, again, the idea is to optimize receptor stimulation while minimizing side effects, and there's very little published on it, but it's currently in a phase three clinical trial for people who are requiring their first treatment, so before they've ever been on a medication but require symptomatic therapy. Similarly, um, they're, also, um, they're also being studied adjunctively for people who have wearing off of their medication, so people who are those uh, motor fluctuators who can tell when their medicine kicks in and wears off with the standard still being somewhere around two and a half hours of off time per day as a minimum. Um, another drug that is in development is this LUAF28996. Uh, this is another dopamine agonist. This is currently being investigated in an in-clinic trial only. This means that people are actually confined to research sites for uh, nearly 30 days. Um, this targets a different receptor profile, uh, D1 and D2, and the early phases are looking at safety, tolerability, and of course also effectiveness. And you know the the biggest issue is we don't have a lot of doubt about whether these medications work in treating the Parkinson's symptoms. It's always that balance of finding a medication that's highly effective but also well tolerated. And so that's what's really being studied in this situation is to make sure that they have their tolerability and their safety appropriate uh, for the clinical effectiveness of the drug. Okay, now on to a topic that is really a favorite topic of mine, and I think a lot of people who are involved in 
treating Parkinson's, but I think more importantly in people who have Parkinson's and their loved ones. So I'm gonna start with some bad news. And what you see here is the bad news of this uh, medication, Sinopanumab, um, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I was part of the study group that uh, this was, that published this. And the bad news is that this was a negative trial. When you look here, um, looking at various doses versus the control group here, so people who got placebo, there is really no difference in how these, whoops, and how these people did. So I think that that's really important. The other thing is that that's um, baseline to week 52. And then looking at the, um, again, at even the second group here uh, with an adjusted mean change, no significant difference among the groups. So this approach um, is something that's of interest. This was a phase two trial. And it was a very, very large study. Uh, 357 participants who had not been getting any treatment were randomized to one of three doses or placebo. And um, the primary endpoint was at uh, week from baseline to week 52 and then 72. And so, you know, the one thing is that these were, if you look over here, and it's small and it's not really that important, but at the bottom right, you can see the adverse event. So, this is a medication that in the end, was very well tolerated, uh, but didn't really de deliver on the goal of uh, meaningfully changing uh, Parkinson's symptoms in this trial. Uh, another medication, prasinazumab, uh, a similar story. So again, these were these two studies were published in the same journal, the same um, the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine in August of 2022. I was part of this as well and was part of the study group that authored this. Uh, and again, we don't see a lot of difference between the groups, although there certainly was some. Uh, the issue is that in both of these studies, the sponsors actually, you know, this is the data that was published, but in analyzing their data uh, beyond what was the main publication and looking at the primary endpoint, they both do have some evidence they believe in my conversations with them that is worth further investigation. And so uh, this is something that there continues to be investigation. There are studies that are ongoing with the hope that they can better tease out who may be appropriate for this and who it may really help, but it isn't necessarily going to help everyone who gets these medications. The general concept with this class of medication is IV infusions uh, on average about once a month to try to address circulating alpha-synuclein. And we know that alpha-synuclein is somehow involved in this process of Parkinson's disease. There's The role of alpha-synuclein has become a little bit more murky as time passes. One of the criticisms of these studies are this only addresses circulating alpha-synuclein. And by the way, it does so in a very highly effective manner. In some of the earlier studies, there was actually a 96% reduction in circulating alpha-synuclein. So the drugs do exactly what they're designed to do. And this is sort of the same story that we're seeing with some of the drugs that are in development for Alzheimer's as well, where they do exactly what they're supposed to do. They do have some change in, in the outcome, but it doesn't necessarily translate into something that is a meaningful change. So there's a lot more to this story that we have yet to learn. One of the thoughts may be, that it's not only surf circulating alpha-synuclein that is the bad guy here, but there may be other ways that alpha-synuclein is getting into cells that are that are ultimately being uh, killed off, you know, initially choked off, and then ultimately dying as part of this degeneration process. And this is where some of these new approaches are being taken. So one of them is this medication IKT-148009. Um, this is a medication that is a cell-based therapy, and it's a it's blocking something called able kinase. And this has been a target for a while in Parkinson's disease because it's been validated in animal models and shown, and actually a couple things happened. Number one, halted the loss of dopamine neurons in those animal models. And then some of those cells that were not functioning, but were not yet dead, um, were actually revived. And so the, the way that we think about this as neurologists is when someone has a stroke, there's usually a rim of tissue around an area of stroke that
that remains viable. And so if you can break up the clot that's causing a stroke, that area, which is called a penumbra, can be revived and ends up not being damaged. It's stunned initially, but that's why sometimes people who have had a stroke are very severe in the first day or two, and they gradually get some improvement as that, that stunned area recovers. So the same concept can be applied here, that there are neurons that are damaged and they're not working the way that they should, but if you can actually unclog them, then we might be able to actually revive them. And so reversing some of the symptoms at the same time. Um, you know, this concept is actually from a chemotherapy drug and there've been some, so Sun Pharma had a drug that was uh, similar in terms of uh, targeting ABL kinase and um, there've been others as well. And so the approach is a little bit different, but what ultimately happens they think is that this may help block other ways by which alpha synuclein may be spreading from one neuron to the next. And I have to tell you that although it's still widely accepted that alpha synuclein spreading is the, the main pathology, um, there's not universal agreement on that. And there are others who are taking other approaches as well. So I don't wanna lead people to believe that this is the only approach that should be taken. And here's an example. So the next one is this drug um, BIIB122. Um, it's a medication that is now, uh, that when it has that BIIB, it's Biogen. Um, I think that may even be their uh, their ticker code on the stock market. Um, I don't know. I don't have any individual pharmaceutical stocks, but this was actually originally developed by a company called Denali. And so I think the original drug number was DNL151. This, and LARP2 is probably something that is familiar as a name to many people. It is one of the most common genetic mutations that's been identified in Parkinson's disease, and it accounts for 4 to 5% of, um, of cases and 1% to 2% of wild-type cases have, so where there's no, or one, 4 to 5% of family history cases, and then uh, in people who have just Parkinson's with no family history, about 1% to 2% of cases. And the product of the LARC2 gene is thought to impair um, lysosomal function. So when you have an, when you have this genetic mutation, you start to lose the function of lysosomes within those neurons. And so what lysosomes do, the way to think about them is that it's the garbage dump for a cell. And that's where these byproducts of, of cellular respiration and sort of normal cellular function get taken, broken down into their component parts, and then they get recycled. So when LARC2 is not working right, that garbage dump in a cell is not working, you get accumulation of this junk or this garbage and that can lead to the cell malfunctioning and ultimately uh, lead to the death of a cell. So this is now currently in phase two trials for people who have idiopathic Parkinson's, so they don't have a clear LARC2 mutation uh, because it's believed that it can be helpful even in people who don't have a known LARC mutation. However, there is a phase three trial that's going to be starting in people with a known LARC2 mutation. Uh, the details of that phase three aren't known to me yet in terms of whether people can be on a, a symptomatic therapy or not, uh, but the study is designed to look at signs of motor progression. So essentially taking a group who are getting the medication, a group who are not, and seeing if that there's a change in the rate of progression of motor symptoms between those two groups. And so again, something that may help modify the disease course itself. And then, you know, there are other approaches. I just wanted to give you some examples of how this field is evolving. And then I wanted to shift gears and talk about some non-pharmacologic interventions, because those are things always that are of interest. Um, so one of them, and you'll see a theme here in terms of concepts. One of them is from a, a company called um, Scion Neurostim, and they have a trial that's called STEM-PD. And the main target of this is actually non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, although there's reason to believe that it will also um, target some of the motor functions as well. It is a non-invasive brainstem modulation device. So essentially, it's a set of headphones that are put on and they're worn for about 19 minutes twice per day. And it's using peripheral nerve stimulation to try to essentially reprogram and modulate uh, what is going on in the brainstem. And so, you know, this is 
a theme that we see also, there's been a lot of attention given to this Stanford glove. Um, and it's very interesting because they have really published no data, um, but they published their proof of concept in a model of Parkinson's called the MPTP model. And what they're essentially trying to do is use a certain signal that's transmitted from a peripheral nerve, ultimately to reset this, you know, to a coordinated reset stimulation. So in a way it's, you know, if you ever talk to an IT person because your computer is malfunctioning, um, they tell you, the first thing they tell you is, did you turn it on and turn it off or turn it off and turn it back on? So we can't turn the brain off and turn it back on, but by using a tool like these, the goal is to try to reset uh, the way that the brain is working and trying to help manage the symptoms of Parkinson's. So the as much excitement as there is about the Stanford glove, there have been a handful of people that it has been used in. There has yet to be any placebo controlled trial, so or a sham trial where they're wearing a glove that doesn't have the active treatment. Uh, but the concept is that it vibrates with cer certain specific specifications with the intention, intention again of having non-invasive stimulation into the brain. So again, you see this theme that non-invasive stimulation is being investigated very seriously. Um, and there is reason to believe that it will, will yield some promise. When we look at the essential tremor population, for example, um, there's actually a device called the Calatrio that has been cleared by the FDA, and they have data that show that in the people that it works for, which was about 62% of people who have essential tremor, they saw about a 50% reduction in their tremor. So there's reason to be hopeful, um, but neither of these are available in any way other than participation in a clinical trial. And again, the goal of the trials is to prove that one of these or both of them or any others that are being studied work and make sure that they're safe for people to use as well. One last non-pharmacologic intervention I just wanted to mention briefly is one that's being done by the Parkinson Study Group. Um, and we talk a lot about exercise and Parkinson's disease. We talk about the role of therapy, but no one's ever really studied clearly what is the right way to administer this. And is it better to do it in intensive bursts like LSVT big is where it should be an hour a day, four days a week for four weeks? Or is it something where you do it a little less often, but have it over a prolonged period of time? And so the Parkinson study group is currently in the process of identifying sites to do a study like that. Because again, non-pharmacologic, but we know that the exercise is an, and therapy are very important interventions in man managing Parkinson's disease. So I was going to stop there and uh, I wanted to make sure I allowed lots of time for questions. So hopefully I've at least uh, piqued your interest a little bit and um, open the floor to some questions. Oh, Dr. Ellen Bogan, what an excellent presentation as usual. I do want to tell the people in the audience, we have 64 people on this call. And so um, perhaps using the raise hand feature or the chat um, might be useful, but um, I thought this was excellent. And um, obviously the most important message is we all need to do our part with research. So with that, um, do we have any questions? And you can unmute yourself. Look, you did such an excellent job. Well, I'm sure there's some coming. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That's why, but I remember that's why, that's why they still don't mute me, right? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hello. Yes, Nancy. Okay. Yeah, Nancy Harrison. I have a couple of questions regarding the glove. Um, I, Dr. Ellen Bogan, I assume you saw the uh, the uh, video on uh, the Today Show last December uh, that, you know, Dr. Tass from Stanford was featured there and he showed uh, two or three of his um, probably most dramatic uh, um, Lee improved students. Did you see that? I did not. Okay, you know, uh, it's easy. You can retrieve it very easily uh, sure. either, in case you're interested, but it's pretty interesting, of course, in that. And then when I've read um, other things, um, 
uh, associated with that. He was saying that it, it sounds as if right now they are going through a trial in which they um, really uh, he 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 identified the need, he identified the need for a uh, placebo uh, one though that obviously people with the gloves it's it's different than getting a pill or whatever right you can make a pill look right. like the well, regular. There's a so there the concept there can be sham gloves with it and study design so that not using the same frequency of stimulation you know vib because it uses vibration and so in the end by changing the pattern of vibration into something that isn't going to be that re system reset if you will they can still do a, a study with a sham glove so right and I think that's what they're embarking on now I yes think. they are. Okay, I think that I read that it might be completed by August or whatever. Um, some of us were talking and it was like, we obviously we're not technologists, but um, why does something mechanical like that, I guess, have to be approved by the FDA? Isn't there a different organization that would have to, you know, first do no harm? I get it. But what's what if that information looked like it was positive? What would be the big holdup in, in getting that approval process? You on the inside know how that works. So there's a couple of things. I mean, so number one, they want to prove that it works. Number two, they have to prove that there's no real side effects from it. Because again, mm -hmm. the concept is they're using that peripheral signal to impact the brain. So it's not as if there aren't potential side effects and they could be minimal things like lightheadedness. They could be double, when you're talking about the brainstem, double vision, um, trouble swallowing, et cetera. So they need to prove that it's safe in addition to proving that it's effective. The other thing is, I mentioned this device for essential tremor, for example, even though they cleared those hurdles, uh, the next step was that uh, that device has been available for easily a couple of years. It wasn't until the first of this year that Medicare started covering it. So mm -hmm. you know, the thing about treatments like that is until someone's actually paying for it, it is cost prohibitive for many people to have access to it um, otherwise. So that, that's the other piece of that. And I can guarantee that if it does meet those hurdles, they're going to make every effort to commercialize it for, you know, whomever's gain, whether it's the department that Dr. Toss is from at, at Stanford or, you know, some company, et cetera. So there, I mean, there's a whole host of, of hurdles that will be in the way, even if it is shown to be effective, but we need to make sure that it's both safe and effective first. And, you know, although it's nice to have, even if you had, you know, 30 or 40 anecdotes or open label sorts of uh, experiences, that doesn't equate to a, a study. And so the study actually needs to be done against placebo, a placebo, or in this case, a sham to really demonstrate that it is effective when you compare it. Sure. And I, I think uh, me and, and all of the folks that I know in the PD community felt that same way. But uh, just because we I have loved ones that have PD and we're impatient and everything else, it was almost a little bit of a, for me personally, almost a little bit of an affront to have something so beautiful and so dramatic on national TV and, and, and be still so far from ever, from, from getting there. You know what I mean? It, it caused such a furor. It mm -hmm. caused so I many agree. positive, beautiful, th you know, thoughts of people to, where can I get a glove, you know? And then in the meantime, apparently, um, also th there's all sorts of other things available like on Amazon, let's face it, with, you know, vibrating socks and all that. Those purchases went through the roof. And I was like, oh man, I'm really disappointed. I'm glad that that's going on that I didn't know about before, but you are, in the in the area of human interest, you 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 teased us so badly. Um, I was personally disappointed. So sorry about that. <laughs> well, no, I, I understand your frustration, and you know it's frustrating on our end too because people are spend a lot of time talking about it, and you know, the reality is that it's not available in any way other than a clinical trial. And you know, so I would encourage, as Julia said, you know, we need people to participate in all kinds of clinical trials, whether it's devices, whether it's medication, whether it's things like the Parkinson's study group trial about what's the best way to administer therapy. And so there's lots of ways that people can contribute. And so, you know, that that's to me the, the larger take home message in all of that. Yeah, thanks.
Thanks, Nancy. Um, we do have a question in the chat box. Um, I don't know if you're aware, if you can see that, Dr. Um, Is there any research regarding the relative age of the onset of PD or the gender? Would this be apt to affect clinical trials or the effectiveness of a medication? So uh, there are actually a number of natural history studies about relative age of onset. And we know that the disease can, uh, when you make generalizations, that people who are younger when they get it have a different sort of course than people who are older when they get it. And it both in terms of responsiveness to medication, um, progression of motor symptoms versus non-motor symptoms and so on. And you know, so in general, the younger population tends to have more severe motor symptoms and progression of motor symptoms with fewer non-motor symptoms earlier in the course of the disease. And conversely, older people tend to have more of those. The question about gender, you know, it's really 60% of people who have Parkinson's are male. Um, so there, there's going to be that gender bias regardless. Uh, then you know, it, it is taken into consideration in clinical trials. And you know, this is one of the one of the big issues um, in trials themselves. You don't want trials to be too homogeneous where everyone in the study looks the same. So you don't want a, a population of you know, entirely 65-year-old Caucasian men. And there's actually a company that called Alcanza, which it, it owns a number of research sites around the country. And their main focus is to... I mean, their focus is to be involved in clinical trials, et cetera, but one of their missions is to try to be more inclusive and you know, include underrepresented populations, whether that's by gender, by ethnicity, uh, et cetera. And so you know, the, the goal is that you have ultimately studies that, that are reflective of the population and the population of people who have this, this disease in this case. So you know, there, there's certainly things that need to there needs to be a better job done, but this is on the radar. And so it's something that hopefully um, people will be more apt to participate. There are some cultural biases of, against participating in research. Um, and so you know, th those are biases that you know, hopefully over time will be overcome to some degree, but it takes time and it, it takes building of trust as well. Thank you. Um, before we take another question, Dr. Ellen Bogan, would you um, like to share where people could find out more specifically about research, how they could well, uh, participate? Absolutely. So there's a few there's a few places that you can go. I would always encourage you to talk to your own neurologist, and if they don't provide a satisfactory answer, um, the Michael J. Fox Foundation has a trial finder. There is a, a, another site called clinicaltrials.com that gov which is a clearinghouse although not every trial is listed on either of those two um and then if you look at the the main institution so in metro detroit um at university of michigan they're doing parkinson's research although much of it is into the, the basic science rather than necessarily with pharmacotherapeutic in interventions um quest research institute uh henry ford and so on and so but i, I would encourage you first and foremost to talk to your own provider. And if they don't have a satisfactory answer, that's where you start to go look at those alternative resources. Um, and, you know, we are always happy to have people come see us. I partner with Quest. Um, but in the end, you know, having people participate is really important because that's how we ultimately move the needle and find better treatments and hopefully get further along toward a cure. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I see it. I think someone is raising their hand, um, but it says iPad Air 2019. I'm not sure if you have a question. Bob Mills. Oh, there you go. Did you, did you hear me? Yes, yep. yes, go ahead. Right. I can hear you. Well, I, I'm one of those volunteers stepping up right now. I've got a, a graduate degree in chemical engineering and I've been diagnosed only a couple of years ago with Parkinson's, although I can recall fighting the symptoms without realizing it for about the last 15 years. So I've got lots of input that I can provide 
as well. But I've had some experience uh, working with the AREDS trial drugs for the macro degeneration by, because I have vision problems as well. So I'd like to step up and volunteer quickly. Well, uh, you know, there are resources by which you, the resources that I had mentioned before, and thank you for your willingness to do so. Uh, again, I know there are people who are on this call that have participated in studies, whether it's Parkinson's or otherwise. And, you know, thank you to all of you, because again, that's how we can make the treatment of this disease better in the long run. So, you know, whether it's through Quest or going to the Michael J. Fox Foundation or uh, and I'm sure that Julia probably has some resources through the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation as well in terms of helping to connect you accordingly. Absolutely. If anybody has any questions, you can always reach us and I'll also put some information in the chat box. Um, looks like we have a couple more minutes. Um, anyone else have any questions? Yeah, I have a secondary question if nobody else has gotten their opportunity. Uh, let me check really quick. Is there anyone else that has a question before? There's one that just popped up in the chat. Okay. Oh, um, yeah. So it, it, totally unrelated to what I had presented about with the exception. So the question is, what do I think about Embrija? So it, it's unrelated to what I discussed tonight, other than the fact that we actually were involved in the trials with it. And, you know, it is an effective medication. I certainly prescribe it to my patients, although it's not effective for everyone. And, you know, there are people that have issues with it because they have a hard time with uh, inhaling it properly and not coughing the medication out, et cetera. But it's, it's one of those three medications that are currently available that are considered rescue or on-demand therapies. And so, you know, my general feeling is that it's right for some people, not for everyone. And, in the long run, if someone is right for that kind of treatment and Embrija is not the right medication, there are potentially a couple of other options that could be utilized so that you know you can partner with your um, with your own healthcare team to try to figure out what are the best ways of managing the issues you have, including potentially trying those other two medications if Embrija is not right for you. Excellent. Okay. And anyone else? Okay. Uh, uh, if you have a second, I will yep. ask that second question. Um, doctor, you had mentioned earlier on just very in passing, um, I think Tim's Lucin versus Terazosin, uh, as, as um, you mentioned that, that it was for uh, prostate uh, health and this is like being repurposed. Have you, do you I, I had, that was one of the topics that the, uh, the conference up in Grand Rapids um, last September uh, being investigated by the University of Iowa. And it seemed like at the time that uh, the um, investigator was, was actually saying, even though that, you know, there's, they're doing more uh, trials, but that the evidence so far has been very, very positive that uh, the terazosin um, was, it slows degeneration in PD, et cetera. And for, I mean, for the sweet spot, I mean, I, I'm jumping ahead, of course, because he's still investigating, but he was pretty darn sure that that's the case. And it, it might be, I mean, if, if males are more prevalent than females in, in PD and mm -hmm. 65 years old is a, a sweet spot, uh, lots of those guys are having prostate issues anyway. And, um, you know, what, what's your thought on that? I mean, is, is it, is the is the data at least um, uh, significant enough to uh, have uh, movement disorder specialists advise their clients who are on prostate medication to just talk to their urologist or you know? So I, I don't think we're there yet with that medication, um, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and I'm going to date myself a little bit when I say this. I, I don't know how many people are familiar with a study called DataTop. But Datatop was a study with a medication called selegiline and also looked at vitamin E. Um, and you know, it was hailed at the time that it was originally the, the data were looked at. So a completed phase three study that selegiline was disease modifying. It slowed down the progression of Parkinson's. And in the end, after analyses were done 
after the original publication, it was felt that what really was happening was selagiline had a symptomatic benefit. And so ultimately, there was an initial misinterpretation of the data that it was disease modifying, whereas in truth, it was that an MAOB inhibitor selagiline was actually just helping to treat the symptoms. And you know, we ended up with the next generation of that risagiline, which was marketed under the name Azelect. Um, but what happened was people who were jaded from that the results of Datatop were sort of soured on using that family of medications entirely. So you can see how, you know, until there's really enough data to have have a, a definitive answer, it's hard to be strongly, even though, you know, he spent, this investigator spending his time and his effort on this medication. So I would hope he strongly believes in it because otherwise, you know, it's sort of spinning your wheels for nothing. Uh, but until the data are there to actually support that, I would be reticent to say that that men who are you know 65 and yes, many of them have prostate issues, that they should be universally put on teresacin if they have Parkinson's. Because we know that teresacin also has side effects like contributing to orthostatic hypotension and so on, and which is something that roughly 18% of people with Parkinson's have significant orthostatic hypotension. So you know, it's always taking the data and looking at it and applying the best way that you can. And so I would say that if teresacin were appropriate in treating that individual's prostate issues, then by all means use it and, you know, feel comfortable that it's not going to aggravate Parkinson's disease symptoms or contribute to progression or in, not, potentially not interfere with any medication. But to, at this point, I don't think we have enough data to advocate that it should be used in management of Parkinson's in any way. Gotcha. Thanks. My pleasure. Well, I just put something in the chat um, that uh, I just wanted everyone to save the date for May 13th. Um, we're going to have our Parkinson's uh, symposium at the Novi Sheridan. And of course, we need an expert like Dr. Alan Bogan to speak, and he will. Uh, as he graciously agreed. So um, I wanted to make sure you guys put that on your calendar, look for more information to come as our planning committee has just uh, is meeting and, and putting together a very nice program. Um, with that, I do want to be very respectful of your time, Dr. Allen Bogan. So uh, do we have any last minute questions? Well, it was fascinating. Thank you, Dr. Allen Bogan. And I will encourage everyone to please, please um, look into participating in research. Um, this program will, it is recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel um, probably within a week, um, as is all of our virtual education series. So. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you again, Dr. Alan Bogan, and we hope to see you next month. Thank Great. you everyone. Good presentation, Thank you. super. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank Good night. you.